Hello, uh, it's it's a special broadcast of Fiber Bindings podcast uh, from Moscow. Today we have a librarian, chief of library, uh, Valery Ledinov. Ledinov, chief librarian of Chief, li- chief librarian, uh, Valery Ledinov. And uh, we're going to talk about libraries and uh, their place in, mo- in the modern world separately. Today we wanted to discuss uh, uh, one of special collections of, uh, of uh, the library Valeri is in charge of. So there are several ways for us to build up the collection of artistic books for garage uh, and uh, apart from purchasing the already existing books that, were already, that are already a state of the art books. We, commission, we have a program of commissioning uh, the artists' uh, books to be made specially for for our library. Uh, that was the project titled uh, Single Copy. Uh, and uh, each year, on, so on a yearly basis, we invite three artists. Well, I wouldn't say emerging artists, or young, or young artists, but the ones, I don't know, without without considerable background in artistic books, or, uh, without any kind of, I don't know, big biography in this genre, or maybe, well, without a big, Biography, well, no. Uh, to produce uh, the book as an artistic object, especially for us, uh, well, uh, any kind of technique uh, based on any kind of artistic practices and observations that are relevant not only for uh, garage but also for the artist. And this, those books exist in single copy, so yeah, according to the title. and. Uh, uh, last year, to Sal and Tony, so those were uh, three artists, uh, one of them being uh, Rastanta Vasiv, a uh, Moscow-based artist, well known for his, uh, I don't know, painting, sculpture, uh, and his uh, installations, objects, uh, uh, which he uh, uses as stuffed toys. And um, uh, when I came up with a proposal to make an artistic book. Uh, Rastan proposed to make, uh, he actually uh, forwarded the idea to, uh, of a catalog of the project uh, realized in, uh, in Cosmos, in open space, uh, because uh, there are nebula in, uh, 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 in the space. Uh, when the star dies, there is a cosmic nebula, which is, I don't know, very, very huge. I'm not sure. I'm wouldn't uh, destroy the fact saying that uh, how much would it, how much space it takes, but it's very, very huge. And uh, the star, uh, that period of uh, during which the star dies, it's like, I don't know, several thousand years. And uh, 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 Rastan's catalog is based on the idea that we can, uh, that we can affect the form of this nebula and that we can uh, produce uh, and we can make this nebula uh, into artistic work. So, for example, we can, uh, uh, we can shape it, I don't know, like, like a rabbit or like uh, stuff, uh, like teddy bear or like, uh, like that. Uh, it is not technically possible yet, but uh, the idea, as he says, does not really contradict to the science. So it is virtually possible, provisionally possible, but not now. And uh, he, uh, he, uh, he even uh, uh, has some numbers uh, as to how much might that cost, because uh, and uh, the general, you know, the total sum of the project exceeds the total sum of money that exists on Earth. So there are no such money, but maybe as technology progresses, maybe uh, the budget uh, will change. Uh, actually, perhaps you've heard about uh, the Dyson spheres, and uh, 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 those are th- uh, theoretical objects constructed around a star or even around a black hole that are, are supposed to capture all the energy radiating fr- uh, from them. And the interesting thing is there are currently uh, projects looking for such technologies. So perhaps in a year or, or two or ten, we'll know that similar things are possible. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> it also reminds me of uh, some uh, discussions about uh, uh, asteroid mining because uh, from time to time uh, there are news uh, like, oh, there was a new asteroid found uh, in our solar system and the total value of uh, uh, mineral resources on this asteroid is, I don't know, millions of trillions of dollars. But obviously, when, when these uh, resources start to be available, they wouldn't be as expensive because uh, their, uh, their uh, price will drop <laughs> radically. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's how it happens with many technologies and resources when they become available. They, uh, it, it becomes more realistic to use them and produce some new things for them. And maybe this, that's what will happen with this uh, uh, story as well. <laughs> for Tavasi, well, what is important here for uh, Rastan Tavasi is that uh, the very realization of the project uh, will uh, will survive, uh, will will continue after artist's death. So that's uh, because uh, that, because if that would be possible, that would take like several thousand years, and that's uh, the project that uh, survives after well after decades uh, survives uh, through time and uh, does not end uh, with the uh, artist's death. So that's what is important for him. And, uh, uh, another uh, point for the artist was that, well, normally, uh, normally uh, uh, the artist receive commissions for something, I don't know, for a design for a cosmic station or some type, not that I know that, uh, for the design or for something like that. And uh, here, artists commission the scientists to make something for art. So it's like a reverse situation, which which was not often the case in point. So that was one of his uh, uh, one of uh, the ideas behind the, behind the project. So uh, could you perhaps explain how uh, how it is displayed? Is it always displayed like that because there is no dedicated space for uh, uh, for the artist's uh, books in the library? Do you always display them like that? Yeah, yeah, we always put them into showcases. So that's uh, the only way we can exhibit the artistic books because unfortunately, well, if we uh, receive a request for, I don't know, uh, individual uh, for, from uh, from the readers, of course, we can provide the books, give give them out just for just within the library, but uh, not that we can really put this into open storage. So yes, that's the only way to, uh, to show the books in the library. So the second book was produced by the artist from DVR movement. Well, it's maybe not really easy to translate because uh, DVR in Russian, uh, it sounds like uh, like an abbreviation for uh, several things. First to be in the historical term of uh, Far Eastern Republic, the Nivostochna Respublika, and the second uh, version being uh, the, the very name of the group, uh, the Nivostochna Resolution, so it's like a Far Eastern, I don't know, family breakers or... <laughs> Okay. How do you say this? Uh, <laughs> like that. Also, like, ch like children of the believers. Uh, it's all kind of joke, but uh, in case of DVR, you, can, you can't always tell a joke from truth. So it's uh, always like uh, oscillating uh, somewhere in between. And um, they are from Vladivostok, uh, the city in Far East. And... Um, uh, they took part, uh, uh, they received the Innovation Prize uh, like several years from now. Uh, and uh, they special, they stage performances, they do music, some musical things, uh, some performative things. And, you know, it's like uh, this art into life, uh, a little bit like everything together. There are certain persons, uh, well, when I invited them to be part of a project, there was there were, there were 13 persons in the group but uh, some but now may uh, the number of people may change but the, the book uh, the book is called uh, vek voli uh, well uh, literally it is the age of freedom but vek voli in russia sounds like a little bit prison jargon uh, and uh, it is based on the narrative it, it uh, well uh, on the one hand uh, 
uh, on the one hand, it is structured as a manifesto. Uh, so this um, special kind of manifesto of uh, the new era, which is coming uh, now because of the different things and all those uh, like new golden age of freedom uh, coming. And uh, uh, it, um, it is based on uh, so-called mythology, local mythology uh, that uh, may be interplaced in Far East uh, because uh, one of the central pieces within this book is, uh, is a picture uh, made by a naive painter from 60s who was based in uh, Far East, which is called uh, Usurizi. I'm not sure how I can transliterate it. Usurians. Usurians. So Asturians, uh, so-called local nations, local uh, local Ottoman nation in Far East, which doesn't really exist actually. So it is like, a, well, not a joke, but some some believe that those Assyrians exist, and they were even depicted. They were even into this picture, but uh, there are no Assyrians in real life, and uh, they play with this uh, this uh, some local ideas some some mythologies some i don't know some musings on on, on uh, local thing and uh, so on so it's kind of crazy it is very very um, a very uh, mixed media thing because uh, it is not uh, all the text is handwritten by one of the artists from dvr but it uh, also contains uh, some embroidery, some uh, some printed matter, some printed graphics, some some photo, uh, some textile things, uh, and uh, the case. Uh, the case it is uh, embossed with uh, beads and it's very hand. Uh, it is a, you know it, it reminds very much of all those uh, old casements of old books. So it is kind of stylization covered in velvet, beads, and uh, like that. So it is like a, a ancient grimoire, but made uh, nowadays, and which uh, reflects more uh, on the future as to how the future might be when the new era of freedom comes into the Far East. So uh, like that. And uh, the third book, uh, from which we can only see one piece, which is this uh, uh, big whale uh, silkscreen, uh, it, uh, it was authored by Sergei Bespamitnik, artist from uh, Novosibirsk. Well, he's, I would say, in his maybe late, uh, he's in his early 50s, maybe. He was born in 1970. Uh, and... Um, the book, well, uh, technically it is a big object which you can unfold and uh, uh, you can, uh, I don't know, like uh, uh, experience in, uh, in, uh, in volume, like a big construction. So I don't know, it is like a, like a machine book. It is a mechanism, uh, which technically is an inventory of all the whales uh, made by artists in different media, I don't know, in graphical works, in painting, in uh, uh, like objects, installations, and um, I don't know, maybe even digitally. Uh, so it is, uh, uh, the book is titled uh, Whales, an Inventory Book of Sergei Bispamitnik. And uh, technically it is uh, uh, it is a book, but uh, Sergei never makes things easy, so it is very, very inventive uh, um, in respect of uh, the form of the book, of the idea of the book, because uh, you can uh, uh, you can uh, move it across. Uh, it uh, has wheels, it has this big chain, and it really looks like, uh, I would say, a little whale, I don't know, like a baby whale, uh, which is now in Garage Library. It, it certainly weighs as a small whale. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. What it was it, 60, 60 kilos, you said? Uh, up to 60, I would say. Up to 60. 60 kilos. Yeah. And how, uh, 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 you, uh, you can't display it. I mean, it, uh, it needs to be interacted with. Do you have any pla uh, plans of like, I don't know, film it, uh, filming it for the Russian art hype or uh, how are you planning to present it to the public? This is what I'm trying to ask. 
sometimes we do kind of show and tell and uh, invite people to interact with uh, the books uh, and during the presentation of the book which took part in april uh, that was actually a case in point people could interact with the book they could they could not only see it but uh, touch it and yes we have already filmed it so i suppose uh, maybe uh, uh, this year on or in the beginning of the next year uh, all the interviews with the artists where they not only tell about the books but demonstrate them on camera uh, they will be uploaded maybe uh, to our youtube channel or i don't know to a special special web page at least there there definitely will be a web page with the photos so yes you may at least have an idea as to how it looks yes uh, so what uh, was the result of uh, of this particular project a surprise for you? Did you expect? Yes, of course. No, I did not expect it at all. I followed Sergey on Facebook and uh, he, he posted his photographs. First, those were just plates with whales, like pages of the book. Uh, it's not a plywood. It's, uh, uh, I'm not sure how you say this, Argalit. It's like a kind of... Those were those were plates on plywood with the depictions of whales, but I uh, had no idea as to how that will be in uh, in real life, how that will be constructed. And uh, when uh, Sergei notified me that the book is finished and I can transport it from Novosibirsk to Moscow, I asked him for the dimensions so that I could put it into the application. And uh, he said that dimensions like like that and the weight the weight is like that and he was also kind enough to make uh, his own case for the book so it was like a big crate with his uh, hand and great uh, things on it and we also keep it in the library because it's it is sort of part of the work so yes i was surprised but we managed to keep it in the library all the same yes we can demonstrate it in showcases but showcase is not uh, the only thing that we can do here so yes uh, i'm I, I was actually very satisfied with the book because uh, all the books, uh, well, at least, well, not all, but many of the books that uh, were realized within the framework of the project, they were, they uh, technically looked like a normal book. So uh, they were bound or unbound. Uh, it, uh, they had pages, text, and uh, pictures on them. So it was interesting about the content, but it was not really experimental in the sense of the form of the book. And that is a starting point to experiment for us with the form of the book, with the idea of the book, as to how, uh, how a book may stay a book, but move as far as possible from the idea of the traditional book uh, per se. So yes, it was very good, very good start for this. Okay, so next, next you led us to, to the archives. <laughs> yes, and uh, the library, which I'm in charge of, uh, technically is a part of research department and research department is a collection of the museum. Collection being not the collection of works, but the archive collection, the documents, things that document the history of works, but not the works themselves. And the history of the archive dates uh, way back to 1989, I would say. And uh, the archive was uh, founded by Sasha Obuchova, a historian, uh, art historian and a curator of the exhibitions. When Sasha came across the idea of archiving things, she just did it by herself. She visited artist studio, asked them for some materials, and you know, uh, the archive well materials. Those might be like I don't know all those ephemera that we always put into the trash bin, and uh, she had to explain artists what is archival material, what is to be uh, what is to be archived. So it was like building up the things uh, from from scratch, from the very beginning of it. And um, as, uh, as history progressed, uh, the archive was supported by different institutions, even by George Soros when he was active in Moscow. And uh, until uh, finally in 2012, uh, the collection was purchased by 
uh, Sasha Obuchova's collection was purchased by Garage Museum, thanks to which Garage obtained the status of the museum because it was a center of contemporary culture before. And uh, now it is, uh, and uh, after um, having purchased the archive and having founded the research department, Garage became the museum. Uh, library. Uh, that I work for was first just, I don't know, small part, small book part uh, within the archive. And in 2014, we opened like a reading space with open storage for everyone. Uh, inde uh, not independent, but uh, I don't know, in a sense of territory, it is like independent from the archive. Uh, there is a reading space. This approach to collecting all, all the small bits and pieces reminds me of uh, some of our discussions with, uh, with the conservators, book and paper conservators, who talk a lot about uh, the modern approach to uh, conservation when, when you are uh, working with a book you often try to keep as many of the inside things, even the micro things like dust or something like that as possible, because all of that is a part of the history of the book. Yeah. And, uh, or I don't know, some, uh, some uh, uh, hairs or something like that, that suddenly appear in the book, because this may uh, provide some additional information on, on who and when used this book. <laughs> well, it may be interesting historically. Yeah, the, the, um, an interesting thing about archiving the, the contemporaneity is that uh, you archive things that were not really designed to endure. For example, well, I can recall the case uh, from Getty, uh, from the colleague, uh, the case of Getty Research University, uh, uh, which preserves the archive of um, of Harald Zeman, uh, the Swiss curator. Uh, he was involved in uh, theater, and uh, uh, they have to storage. I don't know all this um, requisite all those things uh, that are used for uh, I don't know, like for stay uh, for uh, as a uh, attributes of. The Performances like all those I don't know like small uh, uh, small wigs or um, uh, this um, uh, hairbrushes which mm -hmm. were made mm -hmm. very very cheap plastic and it doesn't really endure uh, it uh, uh, it almost expires after several years but since it is a part of Harold Zeman's archive it should be preserved for years and uh, so we have to I don't know violate the nature of the things if we preserve the uh, a contemporaneity. That's uh, for me. It's like a very funny evidence. Uh, yes. You showed us a very interesting small object, a small chair. Could uh, could you talk about that a bit? Yeah, it was made by Alexei Shigalov, uh, an artist. Uh, I'm not sure from which city, from Perm, maybe, but he migrates between different cities. And um, it is a small um, thing. Well, actually you can use it for, for uh, keeping needles on it. You can pick it in to, 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 mm -hmm. to, so, they, so that they do not fall on the floor or not get lost. Yeah. <laughs> not get lost, but it is actually made of spray cans, um, which were used by uh, Alexei himself but uh, this object, this small chair, was produced by his father, who went to retirement, who went to pension, and uh, he was thinking about what to do, how, and uh, he found his this uh, occupation based on his son's observation into contemporary art. So it's like a joint project, and it is a document. So we keep it uh, as a kind of document. It is not uh, well. Of course, you can exhibit it uh, as a piece of art. No one can prevent you from doing that. But uh, uh, it is uh, uh, archival material of a historical value, not only of artistic value for us. Cool. <laughs> what can I say? It's 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 so interesting to see all these different uh, objects, strange objects in in the library. So uh, yeah, it was it was a nice experience. Technically, uh, this object was from the archives, so I'm not in charge for this. My okay. colleagues. Sorry. <laughs> no, We're part of the same department, but uh, you know all those different collections. So it's uh, it comes from different collection. I do not oversee it. I oversee artistic books. It's different. Okay, so what happened next?
I think we switch to some of the other book objects. So here is uh, the other book made uh, as part of single copy project. Uh, the artist uh, is uh, Ludmila Baronina, who was back then based in Krasnodar. Now she moved to Moscow, but I invited her as an artist from Krasnodar because one of the objectives behind the project is uh, to represent different artistic contexts and not being only Moscow centered. And uh, it is uh, a book, uh, the cover came from a real book of um, uh, collected works uh, by uh, Nikolai Gogol, uh, published maybe in the uh, 50s, I suppose. Uh, and um, the book is a reproduction of reproductions of reproductions of Ludmila Baronina's works. It's, so it contains uh, the reproductions as well as uh, her actual drawings, like, like that with, uh, with the doves. And uh, it is like a small museum, a small museum of Ludmila Baronina, organized as a narrative. I don't know, like moving from uh, from Earth to the air, then underground into water and uh, into outer space. Uh, it is called the Fjord. Fjord uh, is the title of the hotel, abandoned hotel in Montenegro. Uh, and uh, Ludmila Baronina was the um, artist in residence in uh, Montenegro and she came across this for second building, which was really uh, impressive, um, uh, impressive example of um, uh, socialist modernism of uh, uh, of that era and pure also like a kind of i don't know as a natural phenomenon it also presents kind of traveling between between different layers of uh, of the world and um uh, but for me, this book is mostly uh, is interesting about its graphical things because uh, Ludmila Baronina uh, uh, is a wonderful uh, is a wonderful graphical artist, and her uh, pictures, her works are very saturated with the details, very rich with the small nuances of I don't know drawings in a, a, a small. Uh, um, uh, uh, it is very multi-layered. Uh, I've, I've been reading this book, reading this book uh, many times, and uh, on each page I always find something new because it is really, really multi-layered. It's very rich. Uh, so yes, it's kind of kind of metaphorical traveling between different uh, between different layers of the earth, of the world, meanings. And uh, things like that. It is very thick. Uh, it is made on cardboard, uh, layered with a with a paper and some works also reproduced and digital printed and uh, uh, glued upon uh, upon the pages. So you always have the impression that there is something inside the page that you missed something. You you did not really miss anything, but you feel like you do. That's 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 an interesting effect and uh, an interesting idea too. You know, to to make the reader double guess, uh, and uh, the reader and the viewer of the book double guess if they missed anything just because the the, the yeah, pages yeah, are. Yeah. <laughs> so it is basically both a micro museum of her work and an encyclopedia of a made up world in uh, in the lieu of uh, in the way of uh, Serafini's works, right? So it, it does remind me of Codex Serafini's Sun World. Well, for example, those pages contain the reproductions of the works that were on view in the Moscow gallery uh, um, that were into the exhibition that uh, took part at the same time when the book was realized. So, uh, yes, uh, there is a small museum of, uh, of the artist within this book, but uh, yes, it is mostly like this visual narrative about the world. So it's like a, it's like a huge world in a small book. So the next book is made by Natalia Smolanskaya, a Russian artist and also a theorist and a professor of art history and uh, art theory uh, at uh, local universities. Um, she's famous for her collage works and uh, also for her artistic books, uh, which unfortunately I did not manage to purchase, well, uh, the most beautiful works because they were already sold and they're already part of uh, some private collections. I don't know, maybe the own collection, but this uh, small, uh, small liberal book, uh, accordion book uh, is called the, the Journey of uh, uh, Red Square. And uh, you can really make uh, this small red square travel through the holes and cuts 
in this uh, uh, in this small apparel. It's uh, quite simple idea, but it's it is uh, it is handmade and it is like a special graphical work. I like this for this special quality of this this uh, um, this drawing drawing thing. Uh, and of course, it's a reference to Russian avant-garde because uh, it's a famous book by uh, by Lisitsky about two squares, black and uh, and red one. So it's a kind of throwback to the history. A facsimile of it was published a few years ago, and I have a copy, and it's yeah, 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 it's yeah. a really nice book. Yeah. Yeah, it was republished, and PDF is available online. So yeah, you you can have an idea of what it looks like. So uh, the next items are made by Anton Gutkov. Uh, he's originally from Omsk, uh, one of the most important cities of Siberia, but he's now based in Moscow. He relocated some, some years from now. And uh, he, uh, he makes books, well, like all the time. It's like a constant process of reworking stuff, things around him. Uh, he, he actually worked uh, in a uh, in a theater, and he was uh, he was in charge for the requisite uh, uh, in theater. And uh, since he was like uh, on this managerial uh, kind of work, uh, there was a lot of things lost and found around him. And uh, when he had a coffee break, or I don't know, during the performance where he had no actually where he did not have to work directly, so he did. Did things he did his works of what was found around him, and um, so it's a collection of, of everything of I don't know like of different images produced by the artist reproduced by him, or uh, things found on the walls on the street or uh, well anything. So it's like a constant process of printing, reprinting, working and reworking uh, of uh, the imagery. Uh, Around him, and also some of his, uh, some of his own images. One of my favorite books. It's a small book in a, uh, in a red cover, uh, which consists of a rubber stamp prints, uh, as invented by uh, the artist. All those images were just were made by the artist on a collection of uh, rubber erasers. So just uh, like uh, like forms for the printing graphic. Uh, graphics but this kind of hand may think this this one uh, and yes I suppose it, uh, I like it because of its graphical quality because I like the kind of imagery like this it's I don't know for me it's like a guilty pleasure because each time Anton demonstrates me some of his new things I always say yes of course we would like to have it for the collection because I think it just looks very good and it's very up to date it's not it is not um, uh, 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 it's uh, for me. It's kind of out of time because it fits. Uh, it fits well to the present day situation. But uh, those images could have been invented. I don't know years from now. But it doesn't make him obsolete. It looks. Uh, it looks nowadays in those days where this is made. I would say like this. So it's uh, so it's like a constant process of printing uh, here, like work in progress. <laughs> This book, I think, is uh, very funny. It is called Siberian Mantra. And uh, for those who are based in Siberia, as Anton said me, it is very, uh, very understood. It's very comprehensible thing because, well, it reflects the way, like, I don't know, the stereotypical way uh, people think when live outside of, I don't know, big cities or outside of metropolia. Uh, but it's a joke. Uh, at the same time, and you should experience uh, this joke by turning the pages because it really looks like mantra. It says like uh, 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 to leave Russia, and so you uh, turn the page after page, uh, which say uh, leave, uh, I want to leave Russia, leave Russia, leave Russia, and then it says okay, but when I think about this, it makes me feel better, and uh, then you. Uh, come to those thinking about it in Russia again, and then you uh, run into a page which says, okay, when I leave Russia, I would, and uh, it lists all the dreams that you that can be realized when you're outside of Russia. So it is kind of joke, 
Uh, uh, but uh, but uh, but also isn't it reminds me of like half uh, half the, the, the uh, semi drunk discussions I have me, uh, with my friends. Oh because, yeah, yeah yeah you know yeah. I'm leaving Russia I'm leaving Russia I can't stand it. But when but everybody uh, but almost everybody stays and when you ask them what they're gonna do when they leave, they're kind of lost because they want to do all the same things with the same people they do it in Russia but in a better place so it's yeah. it's like it's like a book about internal immigration like yeah. you want to leave Russia without leaving Russia so it, it's like it's like reaching heaven <laughs> leaving Russia is reaching heaven that's what I like about these books this sense of irony which is in it because it doesn't really uh, uh, it, it's not uh, an actual call for a living. It's uh, playing out this uh, this stereotype of uh, seeing things like when you leave Russia, you you're going to reach a better place. But uh, normally, it's not always the case in point. And here, this kind of distance towards this way of thinking. So that's why I like this. So the next book is a mail book. Uh, transport invoices, mail invoices from all that mail delivery received by the artist, so maybe found somewhere else, some found, uh, and also some uh, some found material, some found stuff from, from local press, from local periodicals, mm, kind of uh, not even subcultural, but I would say countercultural thing, because it's made of all those absolute ephemeral things that are not really valuable, but are made valuable here uh, in this book. Uh, and based on a very simple idea, which looks very, very inventive. Uh, what I really like about Anton Gutkov's book, uh, books is that they, they're very vivid and very inventive about the visual qualities. It is, uh, those are really the books uh, uh, based uh, on an idea, but it's really interesting to look them to, uh, I, I don't know, to turn the pages, to find something new on each page. Uh, and, uh, and it's uh, and it always works with uh, uh, with each of his books. I also love, like how he plays with the urban text. You know how you go around the city and you see all the advertisement uh, yeah. uh, placed everywhere, and sometimes uh, uh, you see like a frame, like this would uh, this would be nice and. This is what he seems to be doing. He ca captures those moments and preserves uh, them inside his small books. Yeah, like redesigning uh, the environment. I don't know, like creating your own visual environment of all the uh, deputies that, uh, that are around you that are not valuable, but you can rearrange them in a more interesting way. So this book is made by Igor Ponosov, uh, who is famous as a street artist, not only, uh, not only for his artistic practices, but also uh, as a researcher. He authored a book about, uh, about the history of street art in Russia and abroad, one of, maybe not one of the first, but the first one to be written completely in Russian by Russian researcher. Uh, so he's very conscious, not only, uh, not, not only about the meaning of what he's doing, but about the history of it. And uh, I like, I like the idea of it, and uh, uh, one of uh, one of uh, his uh, well, some of his works are made of uh, street banners, advertisement banners, uh, which he cuts out, collages, and uh, reworks in uh, different combinations. So here, here you can see an example. So. Uh, the, a book made of banners combined with the photographs, the photographs that document the performances of Igor Ponosov, because one of his performance was um, uh, he made a tent, tent of uh, uh, I, uh, I, I don't know, uh, this uh, kind of trench coat which protects you from, uh, from, from the rain, but at the same time it uh, really looks like a tent that you can carry on, that you can have on yourself. And uh, it was also made of not street banners, but this kind of material that, that is used for, to cover the buildings uh, which are constructed, you know, uh, with the appearance of, uh, of a future look of those buildings printed on it. And so, uh, out of it, he made this, uh, this garment and the process is, uh, is documented. 
So those those things they may also be stretched, uh, not on canvas but on a metal frame and be presented as a work on surface. And uh, he also made, uh, as far as I know, there are two copies of uh, this book, but each one is unique because each one is made of different kind of banners. So it is not uh, it is not a copy of a book. It's, 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 it's the book that we have. This, this once again some, uh, reminds me of something we discussed with the British uh, bookbinder and book artist Mark Cochran. And uh, yeah. at, at some moment we asked him if uh, uh, when, when he makes uh, several copies of the same binding, uh, does, does it, uh, 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 would he prefer to make all of them the same or would he bring something new to each of the copies? And of course, if, if the customer asks to make, uh, I don't know, five uh, uh, books that are absolutely the same, uh, he, he will, I, as far as I understand, he will make this order, fulfill this order, but then he prefers to make each next books a bit different and uh, has its own flavor uh, of sorts. <laughs> Yeah, but here the difference is uh, inevitable. Uh, is inevitable because, well, uh, since you use the materials that look different, the book made of uh, a book made of them will be different. So you cannot repeat yourself. You just make uh, a thing of the same kind, but which actually is a different thing. So it is not a printed graphics so or I don't know digital print or ultraviolet print. It's like. It's, uh, Something different. It is not designed for being, I don't know, for uh, for for a tirage. It, it is it is always handmade. Okay. Next one. Well, uh, this selection of books uh, uh, belong to Evgeny Stenkov. Uh, he is an artist from Nizhny Novgorod, uh, of, uh, and he is of elder. And he is of elder generation, I would say. So, kind of classic of book art in uh, in Russia uh, was uh, the one behind the art of book in general in uh, in uh, uh, post historic nineties. And he works with the silk. Uh, <coughs> uh, his most favorite uh, printing technique is a silk silk screen, and his silk screens uh, he prints. Uh, on paper, on uh, onion skin, on uh, plastic, well, on different surfaces, different materials. Sorry, did you say onion skin? Onion skin, kalka, da. Ah, uh -huh. I felt like literally. Uh. <laughs> onion skin paper. I well, at least uh, that's what I know how it how it is called. Mm -hmm. I uh, guess, and uh, he is a professional scientist. He still he still lectures at universities. On uh, uh, he's a specialist in radio physics, if, if I'm not mistaken. And his books they oscillate between this sci uh, scientific point of view and a kind of mystical thing, literary thing. Uh, uh, some of his later later over they are de dedicated to the biography of Andrei Sakharov. Uh, because Andrei Sakharov, he, uh, he was exiled in uh, Sarov, and there is a Serafim Sarovsky, one of Russian saints. So it's like a uh, place where history of the science at, uh, of absolutely atheistical uh, period of Soviet history, Russian history, and uh, the very, the very sacred part of uh, local history come together. And uh, those book, uh, those books of uh, Sakharov's. Uh, Sakharov cycle. They play on this, uh, on this oscillation, on this uh, convergence of uh, controversies. Uh, uh, I would say, and uh, they uh, they contain they contain imagery that uh, that is uh, that looks like a reference to the scientific illustration, maybe of the old time from old books, but also like uh, like uh, mathematical or physical schemes that you can find in textbooks or in professional literature. And uh, there are texts by Evgeny Stilkov also, who is uh, uh, also a poet. Uh, so there are his poetical texts and his mu musings and his reflections on uh, the role of Sakharov and uh, 
the meaning of his uh, of his um, uh, his text, his legacy, which uh, which is not on which does not only lie in the field of science, but uh, he was also I don't know like a social thinker, uh, the, some, some um, humanitarian thought was also present in his text. So it's uh, so it is focused on um, on the figure of uh, uh, on the personality of Andrei Sakharov. Well, in general, in different contexts, sometimes not quite evident uh, uh, as to how we used to think of Andrei Sakharov as a scientist, as, a, as an inventor of the bomb. Um, uh, I have a few friends from uh, Sarofa, and I vividly remember one of him saying that uh, he grew up uh, treating those two figures, Saint Serafim Sarovsky mm. and Andrei Sakharov, yeah. as, as equal in some sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are patron saints of this uh, town. Yeah. As <laughs> avatars of the same yeah, yeah, <laughs> from, yeah, from yeah. different contexts. <laughs> I think this thing can be partly into those books. So. So uh, it is reflects it in a, in a sense uh, it's a reflection of this position that you that you said. Oh, this one, yeah. So this is this is one of my favorite parts of our collection. Of course, I like all of the things that we have in the collection, but this is well. Uh, it was one of the first books uh, realized in the framework of the project Single Copy, so it was a commission, one of the first, uh, 2018, um, and this uh, six-meter accordion book, Liparello book, or Oregon book, I don't know how what uh, term might be preferable here. Uh, it, it, uh, it was uh, hand drawn uh, by Ulyana Podkaritova, Moscow based artist. Uh, she's a performance artist and musician. Uh, she also makes installations and painting, uh, but she's a professional graphical artist. And um, she works with the fictional characters, uh, one of them uh, named uh, uh, Gertrude the Root, Gertrude Siriepa. And um, uh, it is um, a kind of gender inversion because she's a superheroine with a male, uh, male half, well, half, half people, half animals who are her servants. And she, makes all those heroic things within the city and travels uh, in the city as reflected in fake news, because she also works with the city folklore, with all those city city histories that is circulate in so-called yellow press. I'm not sure if there is a term in English, but in tabloids, so it's like tabloid city. So tabloid city superheroine. Uh, brilliantly uh, executed, brilliantly implemented, so it is very, it's very good about its graphical qualities, and uh, it is really a, a story with a subject, so it's a, it, it is not just sequence of, uh, sequence of uh, images, uh, just for the image sake, I guess, it's like, uh, it's like a history, you, you can read the whole subject, uh, the whole narrative in this, and uh, since uh, the project was, well, there is no direct connection here, I suppose, but uh, the project was made for Garage Museum, which is situated in Gorky Park. And um, uh, Gorky Park is a play, uh, um, uh, each year there is a professional uh, celebration of, I should check uh, how it sounds correctly in English. I, I think it's similar to Navy Seals or something like that. Uh... Parachute infantry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, airborne yeah. troops, airborne troops. So there is a there is a national celebration uh, uh, that takes place each August uh, on the, uh, National Day of Airborne Troops, uh, and uh, they all come to Gorky Park to celebrate this. And sometimes there are I don't know like casualties and uh, and some... other other people are advised not to appear in the city at all. Yes, so the, the <laughs> garage museum was always closed, and we're not allowed to come to, uh, to the city. Only the only the security presence uh, uh, is present. Um, and uh, so one of uh, the histories, well, not even one of the histories, but the main subject of 
Ульяна Подкрета was book is the is the story of um, of an infantry trooper who jumps from Krimsky Bridge to Moscow River, which is not really an advisable thing to do because it is dangerous in many senses. But one of uh, one of the um, supposed reasons for jumping from the bridge being dangerous is that there are giant fishes that eat people <laughs> underwater. It was one of fake news, really. It was taken from a, from a local newspaper. So uh, in this narrative, uh, Gertrude the Rude, she saves uh, a parachute trooper from giant fish who were nearly, uh, who were nearly to eat poor trooper. <laughs> Well, <laughs> and, 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 and the, this character, I thought it uh, 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 she looked familiar, and then I uh, then I remember I remembered she was uh, on the cover of uh, a, a Russian art journal, uh, Dialogue of Arts, Dialogue Schools. There was a, a, a photo shoot where uh, a couple of characters are carrying her hair through the snow. Oh yeah, yeah. This picture, I suppose, was not in the book, but. Um... Uh, Ulyana always develops the history, so maybe it was just uh, just another branch of this story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, I learned, I first learned about Ulyana of her on her personal solo show at Wien Zavod. There was a place called Start for young for emerging artists, and there were a series of paintings. You know, like um, uh, realized in the style of *Living of Saints*, all those multi-part, multi-parted compositions about Gertrude de Rude. And uh, after this, I proposed to Diana to work on the book, but uh, in graphics, not in painting. Uh, and she also has this idea of uh, like uh, uh, fake philosophy, braidism, casism. Uh, yeah, like, yeah, uh, yeah. Like her version of like her version of feminism. But... Yeah, yeah, because uh, because Gertrude the Root, she uh, she receives her power after having worn birch gloves, you know those big ones, and uh, this magical braid, which is not really hers, but which is attached to her each time she goes to 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 be a hero <laughs> heroine. Um, I also have this book made by Mayana Nasibulova, who was, she was born in Barnaul, uh, arrested and educated in, a, in, a, uh, in a Novosibirsk, and she's now based between uh, Moscow and St. Petersburg. Uh, she works in different media, in painting, like mixed media painting, the textile, and also graphics and uh, performance. Uh, and uh, she uh, has a series of these ceramical objects uh, in, uh, uh, in the form of books. Uh, and so we have uh, one of them, uh, which has this double structure. So uh, it contains two different, uh, two kinds of pages, two kinds of images on uh, those pages. So the, the very cover of, of the book uh, imitates the bubble wrap, but uh, it is not actually a bubble wrap, it is made of clay, uh, which was then work, which was then worked out in, uh, which was then placed into oven and uh, covered with a varnish. And uh, uh, inside the book, um, uh, on the one page, we can see uh, uh, the depiction of a plant fossilized, like taken out of, I don't know, of the earth or uh, imprinted on a stone or, um, well, looking the way like you can, like the archaeologist can find it or geologist, I don't know. So like fossilized and uh, on uh, opposite page, uh, it presents us uh, with the with the image of something non-organic. I don't know, mostly plastic uh, plastic packages from from food or from uh, uh, from uh, industrial produced items. So it's kind of non-organic, but also fossilized, like taken out of earth and. Uh, uh, like already uh, the thing that already became history. And sometimes it looks very weird because each time I demonstrate the book, I can see the, uh, I can see the reactions are different. And not only, 
uh, not all the people can recognize the, the plastic packages uh, in this. Uh, some say that it may be, I don't know, like some technical devices, some steampunk or I don't know, some back to the future thing, because it really looks like uh, like uh, an obsolete, um, obsolete technical equipment or so. So it's like a very mundane thing, which is, I don't know, like very everyday use around us, but uh, which has lost its history, which uh, lost its meaning and uh, became more incomprehensible for us. Uh, the, the same like maybe all plants, uh, which are part of the history and only, I don't know, paleontologists can say what what they might look like or things like that. It's, and it is, a, uh, it is the, this kind of synthesis of organic and non-organic, and uh, it is overlapped with the textile uh, textile uh, patches with uh, quotations, I don't know, not quotations, but phrases that actually read like diaries, like some, I don't know, personal notes on, I don't know, the mood of an artist or about the environment, I don't know what kind of weather it is now. And so it is very personal and very very abstract because of this sense of sense of being lost this sense of going back uh, going deep into the history that's interesting i read it uh, in a, a completely different way oh. to me it read uh, as a very ecological uh, oh. theme thing i know it's uh, a most a most surface le level reading but it's so in your face like you know uh this summer i went uh, to an archaeological dig and uh, with every every shovel you find um, uh, bits of pots and bones uh, and uh, pieces of wood and what will the archaeologists of the future find of our generation well it will be plastic wraps it will be color bottles it will it, it, it but 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 still, with uh, enough time, it will uh, get this veneer of uh, uh, of history, because well, you shouldn't uh, uh, pots broken pots are also, also garbage. They're not not particularly spectacular, but a two uh, a two thousand year pot. Well, you take it in your hands and you think, wow, I'm connecting to my ancestors. And so people of the future will connect to us through plastic. And it's it's interesting that you have this fossil of a plant and fossil of, um, uh, of a human object uh, on, on the same page. Like they are in some ways similar. I don't, I don't know. It's a, it's a weird thing. For me, it's a book about memory and not a, a, a person's memory, but a society's memory. But, uh, but the person's memory, as well as the historical memory, the society member, memory, uh, even the recent memory, I don't know, like a short term memory, it is lost very quickly. You know, I can remember an exhibition I saw at Four Museum in Amsterdam, I don't know, four years from now, uh, which uh, was de uh, dedicated to the construction dig on the place on uh, of uh, uh, of the building of new uh, so many of uh, new metro station in Amsterdam. Uh, Rokan metro station. Rokan. Well, I'm not sure about the title, but uh, well, when there are excavations on the uh, on the construction site, a lot of things are excavated from earth. Not only the old things, but also some recent, I don't know, garbage like detritus. What's what's so, sorry to interrupt you, but I, I just I just know a couple of things about this uh, this dig, and uh, what's mo what's even more special about it is that uh, the, ex uh, the 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 metro station was uh, uh, built uh, in in the place of old uh, canal, uh, so there were even more stuff because people uh, drop the thi drop yeah. things in in canals in Amsterdam all the time, and uh, even today you can see b modern bikes and all the other stuff. So that's something they dug up uh, uh, when they were excavating uh, uh, ground for the station. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> all those excavated things uh, they were uh, sorted out and uh, meticulously catalogued and presented on photos, like like a offline catalog big one and uh, many of the things were i don't know how broken uh, or damaged or uh, and completely under uh, uh, complete, uh, 
completely unrecognizable, even if those were like, I don't know, like some mundane thing that we continue to use uh, nowadays. Uh, it was very difficult to understand what is what without the description, without the museum's description. So this idea of cataloging of recent fossils is not really, well, not really unnecessary, I would say, because sometimes it helps. Sometimes we forget things that are around us. We cannot tell one from another or like that. Well, that's, that, that's certainly true. There is, or at least uh, there was a museum uh, in Moscow dedicated to uh, everyday things from Soviet Union. And I went there with, uh, with my mother and she's what, 25 years older than me. And she showed me things that I didn't know what they were for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> was it the Museum of Industrial Culture, which is yes, close now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. That, that's the one. Uh, it's like an Aladdin scape of everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> The same museum exists in uh, in Los Angeles, and it is called the Museum of Cold War, Van the Museum, and it collects all the things, all the attributes from uh, uh, not Soviet but former socialist camp um, countries, former socialist countries, like all these other ideological things, mundane things. It's like a big, big uh, storage facilities of all those. I don't know all those socialistic trash in all the senses trash and yeah it looks very weird but the very accumulation of it how many of those things exist it really makes a big impression i also wanted to to add to pavel's uh, uh i don't know description of his feelings about the book or something and uh, when, when i saw it when you showed it to us uh somehow um the uh, when when I saw this plastic trays uh, cast in in, uh, in uh, clay uh, and uh, uh, I I think due to its color or something like that it reminded me of the modern technologies yeah. uh, where uh, plastic is replaced with paper pulp and uh, paper pulp trays are used because uh, a friend of mine is is a, a chief uh, is a chief at uh, at a factory that uh, produces this sort of uh, this type of packaging and well somehow this book uh, uh, marries these two, two, two concepts, I don't know, through color, through, through form and through everything. So I don't know. <laughs> it really looks like a rusted iron for me, I don't know. Yeah, this this also, yeah. Without knowing uh, how, uh, the content of the book, uh, it looks like uh, iron from the first time, because in, uh, just the association. I, th I think it's a very good, uh, this book is a very good example of an object that doesn't need explication. If yes, it's, yes, it's, it's a completely visual thing. It's not, uh, well, you can conceptualize it in many ways, but you just have to look at it and experience it, uh, uh, I don't know, with a touch. So, of course, the best way to see this book is to touch it, but uh, it, is, um, into, it is very vivid, but very fragile at the same time. It is even bound with a, norm, with a regular thread, like, I don't know, made of wool. So it, it is very fragile. I suppose uh, I suppose those uh, those um, threads they will be I don't know like worn out in a very short time. So we have to we will have to uh, make some amendment works, uh, some repair works. I don't know. That's the magic of ceramics. They are so fragile as a whole, but almost indestructible in pieces. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So Evgeny Stelkov was the one we discussed before. Uh, an, an artist from Nizhny Novgorod, he represents the elder generation of the artists of the city, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, those books they were made by Andrei Olenev, uh, who is also from Nizhny Novgorod, but he is a bit younger than Evgeny, and uh, originally he came from street art milieu, and uh, now and uh, there are several of the artists which also represent local street art, but now they have. Um, uh, this community in the city, which is called Mosterskaya Tikha, like a quiet workshop or quiet studio, uh, Studio Tikha, maybe the most correct way to present them. And uh, they are, uh, and it, it, work, it operates like a printing shop. So uh, now they move to not only to painting and to drawing, but also to printing. And uh, Andrei Olenik is uh, 
uh, he's the only one of those artists who uh, does not only make printed graphics, but also books. And I purchased three of his books. And uh, this one is, uh, I would say, the most experimental of his books in the sense of form, because of the cover of it is made of, uh, of, um, um, of a wooden deck, which is bound, which is like a curve, like a, uh, it has this elliptical form. And uh, the content of it, uh, those are drawings by Andre with a um, uh, well, pictures, uh, drawings, but they are digitally reproduced and uh, uh, they contain those ornaments which remind of uh, which remind us of a text, but the text is not readable. So you can see the book, you can uh, turn the pages, well, uh, whatever way you like, because there are different ways to open the book and to handle it uh, because of its spatial structure and physical structure. Uh, but you cannot read this. You can only, I don't know, visually read this. Uh, the same as uh, the other book, uh, this one that forms a star. If you open it, there is a star on the cover and uh, it really, uh, it really tell us, uh, tells us about uh, the spatial form that it, that it can take. And it is a visual uh, diary of uh, one of Andre's journey because the images are the scenes that he saw in real life, I don't know, in landscapes or on the street or around him when they traveled. And uh, it is also accompanied by a text, but the text in its turn is also not readable as well as a previous book. Uh, it is very, very beautiful about its graphical qualities. So you can, you can I don't know, uh, you can get a uh, big visual pleasure of contemplating this text, but you can never comprehend it. Contemplate, but not comprehend, you know. Uh, yes, I like this book very much. Um, and uh, the third one uh, also has this wooden element and graphical element, and it is made on craft paper. And also this way of work, uh, unreadable words and image, word image thing. So it's basically the very, I don't know, prime, prime material with which Andre works. And if I could ask uh, one more question in, uh, of a more general uh, nature, what are your ambitions for this project? What would you really like to achieve? Who would you like to get into your collection? Or maybe what kind of what kind of books would you like to uh, to have made for the library? Well, um, I'm not sure I can answer just in one way because uh, there are different ways to answer, uh, to answer this question. Because, well, of course, first and foremost, I would like to get the collection growing and uh, to make it, to render it representative of uh, the field of artistic book in, uh, uh, in Russia. Uh, not only uh, being centered on the Moscow, or, uh, on Moscow, on Moscow content, but also, you know, like more extensively in Russia, because uh, as you maybe noticed, I would like to represent, I really invite different artists from different cities to work for the project or uh, try to find artistic books in different cities of Russia. And I do research trips for this. Uh, like they have this option, and um, so yes, uh, I would like to make uh, the collection representative. But uh, all the books, well, okay, not all the books, but many of the books that are in the collection, I just didn't have any idea of their existence. If I didn't meet the artist, or if someone didn't tell me that those books exist, so uh, I just find it out, I just dig it out. I don't know, uh, I just, uh, I try to detect them. So it's like, a, well, not a detective thing, but it's always a research uh, for me. So I can't even say what I would like to receive because I do not always know what already exists in this field. So I have to find things. Well, and uh, maybe, <clears throat> uh, maybe I can say that I would like, 
different regions of Russia to be more represented in the context because I don't know if we take those huge regions like a region of Siberia, like uh, Far East or you know, South of Russia, Russian North, Central Russia, or whatever kind of division you can uh, Caucasus and other indigenous people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so I would like those things to be better represented in the collection because I know some artists from Far East and I do have some books uh, from them. I recently returned from Vladivostok and I brought some of, some of the artistic books from local artists, but I know that there are definitely exist more of them. So I would like maybe to coll to collaborate with them close uh, closer and uh, more 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 productively. And uh, I'm uh, traveling to Siberia soon for a uh, for a week uh, in Novosibirsk. And I know that Novosibirsk is very abundant of the book art and book work. Uh, I know some artists, but of course it's you no. Know, but of course it's just small visible part of it. I know. So I would like to work in this direction, and uh, I would like to know uh, to know it more because I don't even because I don't even know what I will run into, uh, and uh, what is lacking, uh, what lacks in the collection uh, are the works by the elder generation, by the so-called classic uh, um, uh, book artists. I don't speak about Ilya Kabakov or Viktor Pivovarov because it's a very, very different thing. It's like a very, I don't know, like a very blueprint. It's very high profile. I don't even claim to keep it in the library because it's a museum thing for the museum, not for the collection of the library. Uh, but I don't know, uh, artists like uh, Viktor Lukin, Mikhail Pagarsky, Alexei Parigin, and uh, uh, people like that, uh, they are at the moment poorly represented in uh, the collection and it's not an artistic ge uh, gesture of me that I don't want those artists to, to, see in, uh, to be in the collection, of course not, because I like what they do, but uh, it is already well developed field, uh, those artists already made a lot of books, so I just would like to get, I don't know, a good starting point for, for this, to, 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 to have my budget enough for different directions, not spending it on just one direction because the books by those artists, it's, they're very good and they cost very much. So I have to, you know, strategize it correctly. So I'm trying to work on it. I wish you all the luck in the world. Thank you. That sounds, that sounds like a very enjoyable job. That's yeah. a wonderful quest. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I remember when we had finished our uh, interview at your workplace, the first, uh, the first thing I said, what a cool job you have. <laughs> <laughs> and the more I listen, the more I think that. Well, I, I should say that uh, your, uh, I, I, I'm not sure if, if I can call it a job, but your current, uh, uh, you know, work. Of course at, it's a at job, the... I'm at work now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, I mean, Pavel's uh, current uh, efforts with podcasts are also a really fun part of uh, yes, uh, of his life, I guess, and my life as well. So I, I'm I'm so happy we uh, found this venue and uh, started, you know, talking to all these bookish people, including you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a perfect initiative. Your podcast and your YouTube channel and site. So yeah, thank you so much for your interest. Thank you for coming. Okay. Well, thank yeah. you. Thank you. So that's it for today. Thank you all for watching. As usual, uh, thanks a lot to our community members, to our patrons on Patreon who pay us money so that we can edit these videos. If you are ready to uh, support us in this way, please check the link down below in the description. Many thanks to Valeri Thank for talking to us, for showing us all these amazing book objects you've seen in this video. And uh, we'll talk more to Valeri in the future. And uh, well, we'll return to Russia <laughs> to talk more about Russian bookish objects. Bye. Bye. Yeah.